And this is, uh, congratulations on this uh, opening night. Exciting, huh? Yes. <laughs> um, this is your first English language film that you've done? Mm -hmm. I, he's, he's from Chile. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> I hope it not, it's not the last one. Uh, yeah, I don't. Already it's not the yeah. last one. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's so how did this come about uh, for you? This is based on uh, a novel. And I know Rachel Weiss was uh, connected to it as a producer and uh, sort of found the property. Mm -hmm. How did you come into it? And why did you decide you wanted to uh, uh, adapt this, write it, and, and then direct it? Um, well, after that film, Gloria, yeah. um, I received for the first time offers to direct in English. And I was like reading different scripts and I didn't really connect with anything until I heard about this story and I knew that Rachel was uh, involved and uh, was going to play Ronit. And the invitation was to um, write and direct. So it felt really good. I, I'm, I'm not Jewish and evidently I'm not British. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but but it felt strangely familiar, you know. The I really loved the dynamics of this very unique triangle love story, and uh, maybe I felt connected with the the fact that they are people that are in flux and and uh, you know trying to make their best, making mistakes. Um, does that sound familiar? Uh, you know, and yeah. uh, but against uh, or in front of a backdrop of uh, fixed or pretty much fixed ideas or con conceptions of the, of the world. So I thought that that could create very interesting, um, a, a very interesting tension between what, what is really alive and then the idealistic version of, uh, of things. Yeah. Now, you may not be Jewish and you may not be British, but based on your films, you have a real knack for directing women. You have a real feel for that. I mean, all of your films uh, seem to have very strong female roles in them. Is that something you've set out to do intentionally? Is that something that interests you or, you know? Um, yes and no. I mean, um, Gloria was very intuitive. And then, and then I made quite quickly a fantastic woman and then this one. So almost like the, the, the two, I mean, A Fantastic Woman and, and, and Disobedience were, were made back to back right. without any pause. So when we released this film in Toronto, I, I, I was asked um, for the first time about the trilogy. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, oh, that sounds great. Like yeah. someone that has, has a plan. But uh, it wasn't my case. I mean, I didn't have any plan. I'm not being cynical. I was just uh, following um, an intuition, and, and there was something that really moved me about, uh, you know, taking these characters that are somehow on the fringes of uh, either society or narratives and put them at the center and cr create this hopefully uh, complex portraits of them. Yeah, this is sort of, uh, when I, I was looking at it tonight, looking at this, it's very classic kind of film uh, in, in terms of somebody who's been away comes back in uh, and the whole town is kind of whispering. Yeah. And, and that is sort of a classic movie mm -hmm. set up there mm -hmm. that always seems to work. <laughs> yeah, of course, of course. Yeah. actually that was my way of accessing the story because uh, when I started to try to write the script, I was like, I was freezed because uh, how could I get the cultural nuances right or um, I didn't know anything about this, you know, culture and not, e not even Londoners know about Hendon, you know, so, which is the neighborhood where this supposedly takes place and, and my way of accessing was precisely that. This is like a like a sci-fi story or like a western. Yeah, you know, it's the, it is. It's, it's the daughter <laughs> of a king, it's the princess living in exile that comes back to the land from where, where she was exiled or, or from where she decided to escape. Um, and then she has to face the ghost, ghosts from the past. Yeah. 
they're all, each one of them is trapped somewhere within their past. And, and this is a three-hander, as they say in the biz. They always say two-handers. This is definitely a three-hander because the Alice, I thought he was great, Alessandro Novolo. Um, yeah. 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 <laughs> Yeah, is very much obviously right in the center of this, and it's mm. uh, it's interesting to approach it that way when you have three strong characters like that. Yes, yes. Um, in a certain way, it was like um, I don't know if you've seen uh, now in, in internet, you can see um, like visual deconstructions of musical pieces, like baroque pieces, for example, back. Uh, so you see there is one line one narrative line and then th there comes the second one and sometimes they 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 mixed and then there's a third one right. and then the three of them play together and then there's only third one so this was that kind of structure if you look at it um you know paying attention to it <laughs> <laughs> um they are always framed there's no one frame where Either Ronnie, David, or Esty are not there. That's right. Yeah. Even if 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 it's about a reverse angle, their body is always present. So it's a, a technique that works by insisting. You know, you insist in looking through them until you finally, hopefully, allow the spectator the chance to end up feeling like from within their skin. Uh, Matthew, I really liked your scores. Beautifully um, understated and perfect for this film. Now, had you met Sebastian before, worked with him, or how did you come upon this? Um, yeah, I was lucky enough to work on Fantastic Woman um, before. And from meeting Sebastian um, in a cafe in London to delivering the mix score on Fantastic Woman was three and a half weeks. Um, so it was a very short period of time. And then we kind of went straight into disobedience. But it was very, um, it was very interesting because Fantastic Woman is so very clearly a portrait. So our whole conversation was about what kind of melody could we give this lead character. We felt she deserved dignity and we wanted to treat her like a, a classic film star in a way and give her a, a, a great melody and a dignity. Yeah, exactly. whereas, whereas here, it, it's much more of a landscape. So the music is doing something completely different actually. And it, it's amazing how long it takes you to realize something bleeding obvious <laughs> in <laughs> retrospect. But it's um, the thing that we were trying to go for is a sense of um, space. I mean, we just caught the end that um, coming in and just seeing it again when she's standing at the grave and you just see all of the gravestones and you just think every person that's buried there has gone through a version of this story. And so in a way that kind of, we're interested in creating a, a sonic landscape in which they existed but which could somehow incorporate all of us somehow. So it, it's sort of picking up, I guess, almost on the sci-fi aspect again and trying to set them against some kind of sense of the cosmic or some deity or some whatever they might believe in or choose to believe in. Yeah, how do you approach music in your films? Because sometimes a, a foreign uh, filmmakers coming from other countries uh, don't use it at all, I've noticed, you know, and uh, which is not what you see in most American films. Here, I thought it was so perfectly used. What's your uh, thing on using music in, in movies, and in this one in particular? Well, I, I, I love music in film. I, I think it's not... Uh, some people, people think of it as a visitation from a different art, art form, form. And uh, for me, it's not. It's, it's part of cinema. It's, it's like colors, like you know, costumes or um, texture. And uh, it's, it's a part of the process that I really, really enjoy. Sometimes music is coming from within the scenes. Sometimes it's more related to, you know, score. Uh, but for me, a film without music is, yeah. I mean, it's not for me. Um, I, I like to see it, you know, and there are great masterpieces made without music at all. But um, likely there is diversity <laughs> in the world. <laughs> and uh, in my case, I love, I love music and... Uh, um, and in this case, one big, big uh, part of uh, of the musical work 
comes from from Matthew's uh, creation. Um, all this idea of making this uh, kind of like going to a different planet type of experience mm -hmm. through the music, which was so wonderful. And um, and then a couple of times, well, three times to be precise, music is coming from within. So when they listen to The Cure, uh, yeah. and uh, <laughs> and then the, the, the Jewish choir moments, right. which are which I particularly like because it's, it's, it's like so, you know, inherent to that culture and is, uh, it's been being sophisticated for so many, I mean, so thousands of years and it's at the same time primitive and very, I don't know, um, it's like being born in front of your eyes. Mm -hmm. uh, and we, we have the shofar at the, very, at the very beginning as well, which is used in... Uh, in Jewish ceremony, when you run out of words, um, it's the time to blow the shofar. And so at the very beginning, you have this incredible noise that sort of resonates back through the, the years. You don't actually ever hear it again in the score. Right. Um, but there's a sort of, you feel, I've, I always feel like you hear it again somehow, or you remember it when you see them in the, in the graves. But incredibly powerful, mm. something about tradition taking you backwards the same time as we're sort of trying to go upwards into this into this higher plane somehow and at the same time rooting it really firmly in the earth and in the people mm. and that uh, well, in that way the, the, the chauffeur is a, is a horn it's a it's a very primitive instrument uh, we should have one in case we <laughs> run out of words <laughs> yeah, yeah, so. and you just start playing it here yeah. That'd be interesting. <laughs> Call it a night. <laughs> Before I go to some questions from them, I have to also applaud Rachel McAdams, who I thought was absolutely <laughs> perfection here. She's so good in this. And I, I, I know this was Rachel Weiss's thing to begin with, but how did the other Rachel uh, turn up here? They're perfectly cast together. <laughs> well, um, because we needed someone that be uh, a real counterpart to Rachel Weisz's character. And uh, the thing I, I, I really love about Rachel McAdams, apart from considering her a great actress, is the fact that she's full of joy mm -hmm. and uh, full of light. And then this character is somehow um, repressed uh, because of her backstory and her life story. Uh, and, and the wig and the unflattering, you know, way of uh, dressing and all that. Um, that my question was, how can you repress Rachel McAdams? You know, it's like it's, like, it's impossible. So it would. My theory was la was that uh, it was going to be great to see them together, and then it was going to be uh, so so compelling to see her. Uh, coming out, like appearing uh, after taking out each layer, uh, getting rid of each layer. And um, I remember the first time I saw them together, we, we met in Toronto and I was waiting for them and they walked into the restaurant and sat down in front of me. And I was like, um, okay. <laughs> yeah, it, it, this, is, this is gonna work. <laughs> and there was a woman, um, <laughs> Uh, you know, in charge of the little cafe where we met, uh, a very funny woman, and and she was like doing this with her glasses, like, 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 who are you with? You know? <laughs> and it was she was like, yeah. <laughs> and then I knew it was going to work. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. All right, do you guys have any questions? Here, it's one right here. Yep, go. Good evening, as a Jewish person, I appreciate this film very much. The production is totally solidified, and the kind of conundrum these people go through is very well expressed. Um, I'm just wondering, and I sort of asked you this before when you're standing there, why is it that I would like to see a very progressive this occur when the three hug each other, the husband and the two women? I felt like this would be a perfect place for the film to end because it would step past, it would take a solution forward, something progressive. 
Okay, he's just saying um, he really liked the film and uh, understood it all, except that he wanted the movie to end when the three hug there at, at the end rather than continuing on. I mean, <laughs> the next, next time you watch it, you can just go out of the cinema in that part. That's the beauty of Blu-ray. You could just stop it. We believe, we, we, we believe in multi-orgasms. <laughs> <laughs> yes, right here. Can you indulge me just with a couple of details about where you shot this film? And also, did you have problems accessing the community? Uh, okay, uh, he wants to know where you shot it, and did you have any kind of problems uh, getting a community involved uh, behind it? It's mainly shot in the um, north of London. Yes, so Golders Green and around. Which cemetery? Which cemetery? I won't remember. I'm sorry, <laughs> uh, but um, strangely enough, we we almost didn't shoot anything in Hendon, so we were around Hendon, and um, because of Naomi Alderman's, uh, you know, relationship with the project and the fact that she has uh, a lot of people that support her and respect her. We, that was our way into the community. And of course we found some resistance, but we were very lucky, we, it wasn't that hard. We worked with probably three or four advisors, um, like cultural advisors during the writing process. And then that increased up to maybe 12 during the uh, pre-production and shooting process because we wanted to get the uh, cultural texture right, and then in order to forget about it and concentrate in the, in the characters. Speaking of that, I should mention that I mentioned you as the co-writer here. You had written the first drafts of the screenplay and brought in uh, a, another writer woman, um, Rebecca. Thank you. Yes, and uh, why was that? Why did you decide to collaborate after having written uh, some drafts of the uh, adaptation yourself? Uh, well, because, um, because English is not my, my native language, so there was kind of like a, a roof to my capacities, and then that was combined with the fact that the writing process was halfway through, right. and uh, it was great to, to have Rebecca, who, became a great, I mean, she, she, she made a great contribution in terms of uh, texture and, and dialogues and, and giving life to, to those characters. And, and at the same time, we kept working in terms of structure and, and all the other aspects of the storytelling. So it was just a, a great uh, collaboration. Yes, I'm yeah. really grateful to her. Cool. Yes, right there. Um, I have a question for Matthew. Uh, so you mentioned the show Far uh, having an effect on the, the score. Were there any other effects that uh, the Jewish prayers and other Jewish traditions had uh, on the world? He wants to know anything, other uh, Jewish prayers or traditions that had an effect on writing the score for you, other than what you already talked about. Um, we kind of tried to stay away from that stuff, um, actually, and tried to create some clear water because the the Jewish singing part is extraordinary, actually. Um, but it was interesting, we were doing one of these Q&As in New York, and I talked about, actually, we used a lot of round things. It sounds a bit, it sounds a bit strange, but trying to make uh, glass bowls, um, so quite a lot of the sounds are made from uh, uh, glass bells and glass bowls and wine glass and things like that. And Naomi was there, and she said, actually, um, in the process of mourning the dead, you often eat round foods, so things like lentils and things like that, which we didn't, which we didn't realize. So inadvertently, there's a, a whole series of circular objects in there. But I think it's all just about trying to re and try to make every decision that you make when building a score like that, trying to reinforce the central ideas of the, st the story. So often, music is there to tell you how to feel or to um, guide you in a particular way um, or to make it feel authentic somehow. But actually all you're trying to do is reinforce the, the central tenet or the conceit of the film. Um, and so we're very consciously trying to, um, yeah, trying to create a very 
dreamlike state uh, to hold these characters almost um, yeah, almost like a snow globe and a try like a, a screen around it. One of the things I love about the film um, is all the glass that you see in the film. So whether it's in the shower or him through the glass at the end, um, there's a lot of glass metaphors or, or, or using it. So this was something I was like, well, in looking for a texture um, to create something for the film, then you would, there's, some, there's cues like that in the film that you can take to generate sound with. Cool. Um, let's, uh, way in the back, that's you up there. I see your hand and that's it. Okay. That's you. Hi. Uh, watching this film was a really profound um, experience for me, not only because I'm Jewish and I'm gay um, and spent my childhood going to private Jewish school, but also because I directed a short film that followed a similar plot for my characters. Um, which brings me to ask, uh, what are you working on next? And do you, by chance, need an assistant? <laughs> uh, <well laughs> yeah, he, you know, he wants the job. Um, what, well, I mentioned what you're working on. You're in post, you shot it, the uh, English version of Gloria. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah uh, I, I, um, <clears throat> I, um, I, yeah. I made a, a new version of a, of a film I made before uh, called Gloria, like a cover uh, with a different band. Uh, <laughs> and Matthew is doing the score for that as well. Oh, great. So, um, so we don't need assistance for that one, but who knows for the next one. And you don't know what the next one is yet? Not yet, no. Yeah. No, not for sure. I just want to ask, follow up on that though, uh, on the remake of Gloria, why were you interested in doing it again so soon? Because that was not that long ago, that movie. Uh, I wasn't. I wasn't. Um, and then I met Julian. Ah. And then, and, and then, um, <clears throat> and then, and then we said, okay, let's talk after, after I make uh, a fantastic woman and disobedience and see where we are. <laughs> And um, and I felt like after these two films, I felt like it was a good moment to revisit, um, you know, m my own materials. And in the meantime, the world changed, mm -hmm. you know, and, and 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 this country changed, and and suddenly the story of a woman that just want to keep dancing became strangely urgent and political again. Yeah, this country changed. I haven't heard. <laughs> really. Okay, I'll have to look that up. Um, yeah, right there. So, um, I found myself really wanting to see like maybe small flashbacks to young Ramit and Esty. Did you take that into consideration? Was that like any, at any time? <sighs> Yeah, she's asking, she would like to have seen flashbacks. The book is written in first person, so that's kind of difficult to adapt to begin with. Did you ever consider flashbacks to demonstrate their relationship before? No. No, because I hate flashbacks. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like flashbacks. So you can get together with this guy here who didn't like the ending and... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but but I mean I mean for example when when they talk in the kitchen for the first time, and, and you can tell that there is a backstory. Yeah. Um, one way to go is to is to explain everything through flashbacks, and the other way is to suggest that there was something, and then you can complete you know you can complete the blanks, and I think that generates a more active participation, and then the film benefits from your own fantasy because you are fulfilling with the, the, the blank spaces with your own imaginary. That's better than a flashback. Yeah. Yeah, I totally felt that just in the love scenes. I totally believed every minute of that. Where they... Oh, had, well, that was a flashback. Yeah. Uh, don't, don't play with me. <laughs> okay, uh, I like someone up there. Yes, yeah, go. Uh, you said you met a little resistance in making the movie from the community. Since it's come out, have you had a reaction from the community? Uh, what's been the reaction to the film uh, from the community? Um, well, it just came out today, so... <laughs> Anybody from the community here? <laughs> yes, good. Yes, yes. <laughs> All right. 
<laughs> okay, a couple more before we have to go. Yes, right there. Uh, as has been touched on already, uh, you, Sebastian, uh, women are a very popular subject matter, it seems, in your work, uh, but not in the Woody Allen kind of way. It seems you make a very solid effort at telling stories about women in a representative uh, and accurate way. So my question is, as a male, what is that process like for you telling a story about a woman without being through the male gaze? Okay, he's just asking about the process, your process as a male telling a story about a woman, and he says not in a Woody Allen kind of way is what he said, but um, in terms of your kind of way, do you have a process here in approaching stories about women? Um, well, the male gaze um, subject is very interesting because how, how could I make a, a film without a male gaze? You know, so... Um, I don't think the male gaze is necessarily negative. Uh, there's lots of ways to see the world as a man, you know? And um, there, is, there, there has been a tendency recently to consider the male gaze as something bad. And, and, and I understand where that's coming from, but I would invite er everyone to think that, um, you know, N nothing re related to female or male is necessarily bad um, or wrong um, to begin with. You know, it all depends on the context and how things are um, treated. Um, so I, I, when I'm making a film, I'm not thinking of that. I'm, I'm just uh, trying to connect with, with my characters and and trying to place the camera for them, you know, um, but, I'm, but I'm not trying to run away from, um, I don't know. I, I, I'm not trying to be moralistic, that's what I'm trying to say. But I think uh, in A Fantastic Woman, the whole purpose of the film is about empathy mm -hmm. and, and seeing empathy from a whole series of different directions and looking at the central character and her situation from a whole variety of different aspects and so and that felt political as well actually mm -hmm. to, um, to express empathy for uh, someone from a different circumstance but in a way part of the success I think of the Fanta of Fantastic Woman is because it comes in from lots of different directions in a way in a quest for empathy so uh, it's hard not in a way to reach a sympathetic position I think from from coming in at so many different angles at so many different times. Okay, one maybe, more. Maybe it's good to okay. think uh, in terms of a, a, the human gaze. Uh, and that's it, you know, not male, not female, just human beings trying to f tell stories. Okay, we got time for one more before we have to switch over to another show in here. So yes, go ahead. Um, I just want to comment on what you said in response to that. I don't think anyone said that the male gaze is bad. It's just overdone. And I think we all need to take another look at like how films are made, how our own individualized perceptions of the world affect how we actually create the film itself. And then as an audience member interpret. Because I'm a man, right? And I hear someone say that the male gaze is, is overdone. I don't think that that's a bad thing for as men to just step back and let, for example, a, a, a lesbian woman take the, take the reins as a director of a film like this. Or a Jewish director take the films of a uh, reins for a film like this. Um, and I'm definitely not trying to devalue your work because this is a very necessary film. I feel it's a very important story that needs to be shared with the world. Um, I guess what I'm trying to say is like, I'm confused as to what specifically brought you to this story. <laughs> Okay, uh, he was just talking about the male gaze and he sees nothing wrong with that and talked about different issues, but then he says specifically what brought you to this story, is that, yeah, which you sort of explained in the beginning, but um, uh, anything to add on that or what he was saying about the male gaze? No, that, I mean, uh, you know, we should be free, free, 
free to artistic freedom is essential. And uh, if I was um, called to make films only about what is related to me, then I would be doing only films about white men in Chile. Uh, uh, and the beauty of cinema is that you can use it as a tool to connect, to, as a bridge. Uh, so it's a, it's, a, it's a dangerous game, you know? Um, that's, why, that's why I was saying maybe the categories of male, female, gays, we are using them now as a necessary discussion but we need to understand that we need to get over that and, and, and hopefully on to the next level where we are just telling stories as, as human beings, you know, because anyone can tell any story, you know, and a transgender woman can interpret a cisgender role if, if she or he wants and the other way around. So it's not about um, reducing possibilities but expanding them. Yes. Um, you look like you were really happy when you won that Oscar. I, I, I watched was, you. Yeah. You were like I running was. up there smiling. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Congratulations on that, and congratulations on this. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks a lot, guys.